Ads, schmads. If you don't want ads, that's okay. Choose the Dave McWilliams Plus option on Apple Podcasts. And hey, presto, no ads. To understand the economy, you have to understand human nature. This podcast is powered by Acast. How are you doing there? It is time for the podcast. And we have a packed podcast for you today. We go to Russia. We're going to talk about Alexei Navalny. But first, how was your week, John? My week was pretty good. But the highlight of the week, actually, Mac, okay. was young fellas roaring and shouting at you at the Bernie Sanders Oh, the gig. Bernie Sanders, yes. So that was, yeah, I mean, it was... Like, Bernie was brilliant. Yeah, Like, he was. he was really good. The whole the whole night was really good. Well, but... it's interesting you say so. As part of the Dorky Book Festival, I interviewed Bernie Sanders, who I know and I've known for a long time because, for a variety of reasons, but one is I'm on the board of his think tank, the yeah. Sanders Institute. Yeah. So we go over to Vermont maybe once a year. And I, I really like him. I like him a lot. And He's a straight uh, talker, isn't he? He's a real straight there's talker. Not a great, there's not a huge amount of crack out of him, but he's... Uh... Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, yeah, that's that's true. It's, it's He's an issues man. He's yeah, an issues yeah, yeah, man. Yeah. Uh, and, and we laughed about that, you know, afterwards. And he said to me, he said, David, I don't have time. I'm 83. I don't have time for <laughs> yeah, yeah, fun, yeah, yeah. you know. The clock is ticking. Yeah. But it's interesting. You say, uh, you say, young fellas, you know, there were 1,100 people in the hall. Mm, it was fab. And there were... Two people heckling. Yeah. And that's interesting. And they heckled for about yeah. four or five minutes in, in an entire hour and a half. Well, what I found really interesting about the heckles is that, you know, everybody in that room, those 1,100 people, more or less all agreed with it. The, so they were, I don't know who they were shouting yeah, at they, and well, why uh, they were shouting at Bernie. It's a sort of Bernie performative such... act heckling, you know. Yeah. And what it's done is it's it's, it's, it's based on disruption and, 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 and really self-absorption, yeah. right? Whereas there was plenty of space to ask questions. I mean, the whole idea is we set it up, Bernie would talk, then I'd chat to him, interview him, and then we'd open it up to the floor, yeah. which is the kind of, a, I think, the way you should do these things. Yeah. So, I mean, there was plenty of opportunity to ask those questions. Yeah. You know, there, there is one, I mean, the interesting thing is obviously at the end, Bernie got a standing ovation and he was really, really, it was a wonderful, wonderful evening. In fact, John, we're going to have it on Patreon. We're going to make this available the entire evening for our Patreon Great. Uh, fans. And if you're not on Patreon and you want to hear this, you can join up at patreon.com forward slash David McWilliams. So we'll make the Bernie interview available on Patreon, maybe this week or next week, yep. depending, depending on your schedule, John. Exactly. <laughs> no pressure, like. <laughs> exactly, exactly. What is amazing is like, you know, at, at his age to have so much vim and vigor and yeah, energy. Yeah, great. And yeah. like, he just got off the plane, he was jet lagged and he was out and chatting and the whole thing. And of course I asked him about Biden and of course I asked him about Trump and all, all that sort of stuff. I mean, he was very diplomatic about Biden, but I, I think, you know, you can read in between the lines, you know, they've got a massive, massive problem. Mm. with their presidential candidate. They have a massive, Big massive time. problem. Big and time. it's interesting, we're going to be talking a little bit about Tucker Carlson's interview with Putin. And you were saying to me just that Tucker Carlson, there's a suggestion he might be Trump's VP. Well, well yes, there were, that, that is one of the rumours that, that Tucker would be, it could be earmarked yeah. for the, uh, as a VP, which would be awful. Oh, like, like awful. Like he is Mr. White Power Man, you know. But again, you know, it's, it's, it's very good for Trump to have somebody that media savvy as your right hand man, yeah, you know, and he's very media savvy. So we will we'll, we'll release the, the the Bernie discussion, and at, towards the end of the discussion, we talked a lot about Ukraine and Russia and Putin, and it seemed very opposite given that we what we know now about Putin. But did you know, John? It is nearly two years since the invasion of Ukraine mm -hmm. this week. It'll mark the second anniversary into the third year of the war in Ukraine. And we are going to go to that part of the world. We're going to talk to Sasha Kamenovsky. You'll know Sasha and I have gone to Ukraine together on a number of occasions last year. And we're going to get the reaction, his reaction, to the murder of Alexei Navalny. Because it obviously was a murder. He didn't just wake up more, one morning Absolutely. and uh, decide, I feel a little bit sick and, and die. Another one in the long list of murders well, it's, it's by really, the hand of Putin. Yeah, it's a, it's a fascinating thing, John, because you know, obviously, years ago I went to Russia and I've been involved in that part of the world for, for a long, long time. It's actually three decades long now. My interest in and my efforts to learn the yeah. Russian language yeah. and get into all this stuff. But I was thinking, you know, Navalny died in a gulag 
And those gulags were set up by Stalin. Well, they were actually set up, the gulags were actually set up by the czars for internal enemies in the 19th century. And what the gulags were was a series of prisons in incredibly remote parts of Russia, typically in Siberia, often in the Arctic Circle. And the idea was that the prisoners would feel so isolated by being so far away. I only got that feeling once before in a prison. I've ever been in a place called Fremantle in Australia, John. Never been to Australia, actually. Well, you've never been to Australia. So a, Fremantle is in the middle of nowhere, literally in the middle of nowhere. And there was an extraordinary prison there where a lot of Irish revolutionaries were sent in the 19th century. And the idea was the prisons were so remote that you felt that nobody cared about you, that, yeah. no, that you were gone. And so the, the czars created these prisons, the Romanovs, in the 19th century, particularly in the late 19th century. In fact, Lenin himself ended up in one of them. And that seemed to actually have emboldened Lenin and changed his worldview dramatically when he was there. But Navalny was put there. But the interesting thing was, I was thinking of, and I don't always think of Solzhenitsyn, mm-hmm. even though I was a para three last week, I don't always think of Solzhenitsyn. But <laughs> if you actually looked at what interested me years and years ago in Russia, was when I was in school, I read two books by Solzhenitsyn. Solzhenitsyn you were in school? When I was in sixth year in school. All right. So by Alexander Solzhenitsyn, mm. right? And this is, we're going through a very pretentious phase of the time. I probably, obviously at this stage- Hasn't come out of it yet. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Obviously this, I kind of fancied somebody, so Jesus. If I'm reading Solzhenitsyn, you never know what you'll, anyway, the point was Alexander Solzhenitsyn won a Nobel Prize for literature, right? He was imprisoned by Stalin, then imprisoned by Khrushchev, then released by Khrushchev, right? Yeah. And Khrushchev had this thing called the Khrushchev Thaw. And it was basically a thawing in relations with intellectuals. And his most famous book, it was called A Day in the Life of Ivan Denisovich. Mm-hmm. And it's about a day in the life of a prisoner in one of those gulags where Navalny died. Right. And I read that. And it's a really interesting book because it was released officially. So you can imagine what happened in Russia, in the Soviet Union. Stalin goes on this crazy campaign against intellectuals, writers, dissidents, everything. He also had a coup against doctors. He thought that doctors were trying to poison him, his doctors. So he decided to kill loads of doctors just because he didn't like doctors, right? So this is the madness of Stalin's head. And so many dissidents were jailed in this period. And then Khrushchev gets in in the early 60s and he says, okay, no, we're going to open up. And one of the first emblems of the opening up was the publishing of this book by Solzhenitsyn, The Day in the Life of Ivan Mm. Denisovich, right? And it was part of a series of publications by Solzhenitsyn called The Gulag Archipelago. And this is what it's all about. And he was identifying these places where Navalny ended up dying, right? Which were custom-made killing machines yeah. by the Russians. But amazingly, Khrushchev didn't kill people. Brezhnev didn't kill people. They imprisoned people. They exiled people. They internally exiled them. Yeah. They banished people. They gave them exit visas. But they didn't kill their opposition leaders. You know, Andropov didn't kill them. Chernyenko didn't kill them. Yeah. Gorbachev. Putin kills his opposition He kills people. So the regime has gone from a regime that kind of cheats its opposition in elections, like it rigs elections, to a regime that just kills people. And it's 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 extraordinary to think about that. But the BBC World Service also, the Russian service, also used to do audiobooks of Solzhenitsyn. Yeah. Uh, But it was always jammed. That was the thing. Oh, it was always jammed by the Russians? By the Russians. And we did, when we were, because I I spent, what, five years at the Russians in in World Service. But there was loads of, and especially the old guys, and I can't think of the guy's name who grew up in, his parents were exiled exiled into the Gulag, and he grew up and then it escaped from the gulags wow. and ended up in, yeah. in world service. They are, I mean, the the whole thing is that, you know, there is a a direct line, almost a do not pass, go, do not collect $100 if you are a dissident to the gulags. And that's where Navalny died over the weekend. Now, if you're interested in Navalny, I advise you to have a look at this Putin's Palace, Navalny's documentary. But there's also the Navalny documentary, which is a documentary about his the attempted assassination, the poisoning uh, mm. of, of Navalny, which was scripted by, on the podcast, we'd, do you remember 
Christo Grozef. Yes, I do. Actually, that was a really good episode. He was the editor of Bellingcamp. So if you go yeah. back, I think it's from last March, have a look at that. Have you, if you're listening to this, have a listen to this because he was actually in the frontline seat. He was the yeah. guy who actually yeah. helped Navalny trace the very incompetent poisoners. Yeah. And the really interesting thing is they have they established that Navalny was poisoned by Novichek put in his underpants, John, right? <laughs> so Navalny, one of his great slags of Putin was he said, like, we had Catherine the Great... <laughs> We had Alexander the Great, we had Ivan the Terrible, yeah. and now we have Vladimir the Underpants Poisoner. That's what he used to call. Is he used to call? <laughs> That's yeah, he used to. He used to call. You know, and you imagine Putin, this little obsessive <laughs> yes. man, yeah. angry man, yeah. and he's saying, "You know what you've become? You've become an <laughs> Underpants Poisoner." But the problem is, the Underpants Poisoner got him this weekend. Yeah. yeah. So let's go. Let's talk to Sasha Kabanovsky. Let's talk about the impact of Navalny's death, what it means, what it says about Russia, and what it says about where Russia is going. So let's go and talk to Sasha, who is now again exiled in Berlin and can't go home. Sasha, how are you? All right, thanks, David. How are you? I'm good. I'm good. Okay. I wish we, this conversation was taking place under better circumstances, but yeah, it is no, what it is. I, I, exactly. So tell me, Navalny's murder, his elimination, whatever you want to call it, what does it tell us about Putin, about the regime, about where Russia has gone since I first visited Russia many, many years ago? It just seems the trajectory has been progressively and now maybe acceleratingly in, in an awful way, in an awful direction. Well, there's no doubt about that. Um, you and I have uh, had ties to Russia for over the last 20 years. Yeah. And we've had a firsthand uh, view of, of just how much the situation in Russia has deteriorated. And uh, in essence, what we have now is the reversion to the regime of terror of the 1930s under Stalin. And the ease with which people get are arrested and, and thrown into jail for 7, 10, 15 years for trivial, you can't even call them crimes, right? Um, accusations, innuendos, insinuations, people get thrown into jail for wearing jewelry. So there's a story of a girl. She was wearing earrings, uh, frog earrings with multicolored rainbow colored frogs. She was accused of supporting LGBT propaganda, arrested. And uh, I think she's either awaiting sentencing or has already been sentenced. And so what we have in Russia now is this all pervasive fear where people can be swept up into this machine of, of repression for very obscure reasons uh, or no reasons. And I forwarded a video to you this morning of, yeah. of uh, how the protesters, I mean, that I, I don't even think you can call them protesters, just people who were gathering outside to memorialize Navalny and the brutality with which they've been suppressed, dragged into police cars and, uh, and well, their future is, is quite, uh, quite murky at this point in time. So, so let, let's talk about Navalny. Let's talk about the circumstances, the, the medical reports coming out said he died of an aneurysm, which they have used again and again and again. And then his own doctor said he had no underlying medical conditions that would suggest he was in danger of an aneurysm. He was a reasonably young man, although having been in solitary confinement the last four years, any photos of him are gone to any, any evidence. But we're assuming that he was killed in prison. Explain the significance of the death of Navalny to Russians and the certainly of this coming generation? Well, the circumstances of his death obviously are, are not clear. Perhaps they will never be clear. There are reports coming out that actually he did not die yesterday. He died the day before yesterday. Interviews, anonymous interviews that Nova Gazeta has been able to um, undertake with some of the prisoners in that colony that something strange started going on the night before. There were lockdowns, uh, there were unscheduled uh, cars coming in, coming out. So the circumstances around his death are going to be mired in mystery for, for a long time. It's, it's very difficult to believe that this was a health condition. After all, he was in Germany. He underwent treatment and, and extensive uh, medical examination. So if they didn't discover a, a, an aneurysm or, or anything close to resembling an aneurysm three years ago, it's very difficult to believe that something happened of that nature. Over the last three years, he basically was tortured. He was kept in solitary confinement for 365 days, which is, well, I mean, that, that doesn't need any commentary. 
He wasn't allowed to sleep. Bright lights were kept on 24-7. He was malnourished. He did not receive any sort of medical treatment. But it's very difficult to say that there was anything in his current health condition that would preclude his untimely death. And so it's a premeditated act of violence. And the question is, why did it happen now? Putin had him in his in his grasp for the last three years. So, so you have you have a situation where he gets transferred to basically an Arctic gulag in December, kind of suggesting that Putin is still worried about his popularity, the fact that he still had a sense of humor when he was being interviewed, the fact that he's still around, the fact that, again, you know what 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 men with small egos hate is mockery, and what Navalny always did to Putin was just kind of mocked him. He mocked him, and he kind of said to the said to the people, look. You have a bad health system because they have super yachts. You know, you have a, a, a transport system that doesn't work because they have private villas. Like it was all this sort of this constant mockery and, and, and taking the mickey. And again, this is the sort of thing that really undermines a dictator. But what happened in the last two or three months or even the last month to shift that, to accelerate that, to make that relationship deteriorate even more? Relationship is, a, is an interesting word. No, but I mean the relationship because because it's very yeah. clear that there are two men involved here. There was Navalny representing yes. one type of Russian and Putin representing another. Well, I think that there are many opinions about what has transpired recently. My thinking is that there are several things that are happening uh, concurrently. One, I believe that, that the war is taking its toll not just on the Ukrainian population, but on the Russian population. And I don't think that this is being covered in the Western press. On January, if I, if I may just digress for yeah, one second, do. on January 28th, a news blurb came out. It wasn't covered in the West at all. And it was an engineer at a company called Almazante. They build missiles. This is one of the largest defense industries in, in Russia. The engineer's name was Anton Garabets. He committed suicide. And he left a suicide note in which he said that a rocket, a missile, that he helped create, landed in a, in a building in Kherson, in which his grandmother lived. And his grandmother died with the rocket that he built. And he basically couldn't live with himself, and he couldn't live with, with what is happening in the war and in Russia currently. And that sentiment, the, the Russian Putin's government is trying to, to stifle that, that sentiment and trying to show a unified front in the support for the war, but this war is filled with real human tragedies that span the borders. I mean, it's, it's in essence a civil war because uh, uh, you, you, you've you been there, you know yeah. how close the ties are between the Ukrainians, the Russians, half of the population has relatives living across the borders, and it cannot not have an impact. That's point number one. Point number two is Putin is up for the sham re-election in March. The, the coronation 15th, sort of thing, yeah. Right? They trumped out a whole bunch of uh, quote-unquote candidates, each one of them more nervous than the last uh, when he was asked about whether or not he actually has a, a desire to win. But uh, there was one candidate, uh, Boris Nadezhdin, who was a former Duma deputy, he was uh, an ally of Nemtsov. Who was also killed by Putin, yeah. Yes. And he has been an opposition sort of liberal politician who basically was brought out on all of these national television propaganda shows as the token sort of liberal voice to be bashed over and over and over again. Anyway, either by design or by oversight, he was allowed to petition to run for the presidency of, of the Russian Federation. He had a clear anti-war, anti-Putin agenda. In, I think, a month or just a little over a month, he was able to get 200,000 signatures of support for his candidacy. People across Russia were lining up to sign the petition. And I believe this caught the Kremlin completely off guard. There, there are no lines to sign up and support for Putin unless people are paid or, or, or forcefully engaged. And I think that that, that was a wake-up call, that the position that they would like to believe that Putin enjoys within Russia is actually quite less stable and firm. And I also think that the, this interview with Tucker Carlson played a role. It's sort of a trifecta of, of things that have gone not according to plan, because I don't think that the reaction in the West to this interview 
was quite what the Kremlin expected. It was mocked. He spoke for 30 minutes, you know, about uh, uh, Russian history that never actually existed. Something rewritten, tried to give Tucker Carlson some letters that Bogdan Khmelnytsky purportedly wrote. It was not a tour de force that he expected. And I think that all of this culminated in this knee-jerk reaction to finally put an end and send a strong signal to whatever opposition sentiment may still be in Russia, that it's an end game for So them. it's an end game for you. So it's, it's a bit like saying, you know, if, if Navalny is the guy who said, look, uh, I'm going to show you what courage is. I'm going to come back from Berlin. I'm going to come back from Germany. I'm going to face Putin in his own jurisdiction. What Putin has done the last couple of days is basically show people that courage, although it might be laudable, is actually useless. Well, it's, it's the one card that he had to play. He wanted to play this card, you know, three years back, four years back, it, it actually blew up in his face, created a, a, a huge PR problem, especially with uh, Navalny running this this documentary basically into his own death, right? Getting the FSB officers who were involved in the operation to admit that actually, yes, it was the Kremlin's desire to kill him. And there's a huge ax to grind. And I think that at the end of the day, the regime is feeling vulnerable, my opinion. This is yeah. probably out of left field, but I think that there is a lot of vulnerability that is uh, that is now being sensed by the Kremlin. But if you just go back to your family in Moscow, I mean, what are they saying? What are they thinking now? Has everybody just simply, we, we, we mentioned Stalin at the top, right? Khrushchev didn't do this. Brezhnev didn't do this. Obviously, Andropov didn't do this. Chernyenko didn't do this. Gorbachev didn't do this. Yeltsin didn't do this. I mean, you know, the the, the this is the behavior of somebody who is so far beyond even the last five or six end presidents of the Soviet system. I'm including Yeltsin in that, right? You know, you look at even the Brezhnev years. Yes, you read your Solzhenitsyn from Khrushchev, people were locked up, there were gulags, but they weren't going around murdering their opposition figures. I mean, this is like if the white South African government had murdered Mandela had actually gone in and killed him in Robben Island. And even the white South African government didn't do this. So it kind of gives you a sense of how beyond the pale this sort of behavior is. Well, I mean, you have to understand that no one, no one talks about this. And the war and everything that's happening has torn families apart. And so the only way that psychologically people can survive who stayed in Russia is to completely withdraw into what is called in Russia internal immigration. And so this is not discussed. Uh, politics is off the table. People have different views and um, depending on where they live. And so this is not something that is that is discussed amongst families and family members and friends. I mean, you know, a lot of things have changed for people who remained, for people who left. And it's reminiscent of the immigration not of Russia in the 1970s because when people immigrated in the 1970s before they left the, we had funerals for them because you're leaving never to see each other again in essence and unfortunately this is this is back on the table because in essence this has torn families apart and and, and no one expects to see each other ever again until something radically changes within Russia. Whether that change is afoot is is very difficult to, to predict. You know me, I, I've been optimistic or overly optimistic on this, but everything about Russia internally is showing signs of, of significant fissures. And how long they can sustain this internal pressure cooker uh, before it blows is, is anyone's guess. Can I just ask you about, you make the uh, Tucker Carlson I mean, interview, again, it was seen, I think, 60 or 70 million times. So, I mean, this is, this is a huge, this is a huge moment. Uh, now, let's just talk about United States, right? Over the last five or six months, a significant part of the Republican Party has been leading a charge against Ukraine, against financing Ukraine, against, I mean, you had Trump out last Thursday saying to... Lithuanians, Latvians, Poles, Ukrainians, look, you guys, and saying to Germans, 
you you guys don't want to pay for 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 NATO. Well, we're not going to defend you. I mean, it's basically giving Putin the greenest of green lights to do whatever the hell he likes, right? Explain to me with your other cap on, which is somebody who immigrated to the States a long time ago, and obviously you're back now. How do you think this will play out amongst Republicans who are really holding the Ukrainians to ransom and don't seem to be joining up the dots at all? Well, obviously it's heartbreaking to see what uh, is happening in U.S. politics, um, especially with regard to this issue. We have to take into consideration that everything is tied into what's going on at the border and the huge influx of, of immigrants and and the, I guess, the power politics that are being played. And unfortunately, Ukraine is being held in the balance to try to get some sort of a resolution to, to what is considered in the U.S. a much bigger problem than obviously a war that's thousands of, of miles away. <laughs> When I have a hard time explaining or or getting to terms with uh, U.S. foreign policy, I always sort of turn back to Churchill, who said that you can count on America to do the right thing um, after it tries everything else. Yeah. And so I'm hoping that this is yet uh, one more case of that situation playing out. I have a hard time believing that even the most hardened conservatives in the U.S., cannot appreciate the existential threat to not just European security, but global security that this situation is, uh, presents, especially with the uh, new intel that's coming out about uh, Russia trying to place nuclear weapons in space. I mean, this is this is a regime that's playing basically, right? I mean, it's, it's playing like a zero-sum game, fighting for its survival. And it's, it's grasping at every straw that it can possibly have in order to cow whatever, the West, the East, into, into acquiescence. And that's a road, I mean, once again, uh, personal opinion, but that's a road that doesn't lead to a good place. It never does. And uh, this problem, it may go away on its own. I, I truly believe that the internal situation within Russia is deteriorating much more rapidly than the West would have it, would like you to believe, or at least some elements in the West would like you to believe. I don't think that they have the capability to run a war for two years or three years or four years. The toll, the human toll, the, the economic toll, the moral toll is far too great. It's incredibly difficult to sustain. Just the madness that is happening in, in Russian schools and Russian kindergartens across Russian society, the the oppression, the madness. Anyone can just go on YouTube and see video clips of what is happening in kindergartens. What is happening? Uh, every school and every kindergarten now has a hero's desk where basically, uh, I can't even call them soldiers, but these mercenaries who were killed in the war with Ukraine are deified. Children are made to, to wear military uniforms. They march around with machine guns. All of the regalia from the Soviet Union has come back so that you see the pioneers' uniforms and then this hyper-patriotism. Uh, veterans come to schools speaking to six, seven, eight-year-olds saying that it's not scary to die. It's really not. The, the death is not something to be feared as long as you're, you're sacrificing your life for the motherland. There's this pervasive death cult that's being ingrained in these children. To prepare them, I mean, it's 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 almost like the jihadist cult that is being perpetuated across the country. But this sounds like a regime that's in for the long haul. This sounds like a regime that said, okay, we're going to get rid of the internal opposition. We're going to beat the Ukrainians. We're going to get this back. And then we're going to say, look, the West are a bunch of divided, uncommitted. The original Putin idea was, listen, the West are old and fat and middle class. They have no real stomach. And now, you know what? Trump gets in. It's a very, very, very short game till next November. And he could be away scot-free. I agree that the game that they're trying to play is for the long term, but every long term game needs to have a solid foundation, right? And it's much easier, I mean, without being overly cynical about this, right? The difficulties that the West is facing are... I mean, you know, we're, we, we have our own issues, but they're societal issues. Fundamentally, if you're looking at economics, if you're looking about that, that sort of the overall health of the economies throughout, we're not fighting wars on their own territory. People are not getting killed by the hundreds of thousands on a daily basis. We have a much 
better <laughs> foundation to play the long game at the expense of Ukraine, unfortunately. And this is the heartbreaking part because if, if we actually did, and, and you, you, you remember this from our trips to Kiev, people do not want to, to surrender. They will not give up and they just want to have the resources that are necessary to carry on the fight. It's much more difficult to sustain this long term. Yes, the regime is in for the long term, but uh, the horse that they're riding is not a championship caliber steep. It's an economy that is that is a 19th century economy. They're completely reliant on China for technology, for everything. I mean, basically, the Russian economy has been China fight. Everything in Russia has not, now comes from China. Cars are from China. Technology is from China. I mean, it's basically China is the de facto supplier of Russia, except for Iran and North Korea that are supplying the weapons. But does that make a mix for an ability to sustain you know, a war over two, three years? I don't know. I have no idea. What what I do know is that people are scared. There is yeah. a prevailing, a horrible sense of fear, and whether or not you know there's anything left in the in the gas tank to try to throw off the shackles of this authoritarian regime, I don't know. The regions are certainly much more rest, and you've seen that in Buryatia, you've seen that in 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 the Caucasus, where where people are not as willing to comply with what's happening. John, you want to come in there? Yeah, actually, it's, it's interesting, Sasha, that only last week the Russian ambassador to the UK was talking about Russia has endless resources and therefore will win the war. I mean, I'm, I'm assuming that's just part of the narrative that they're they're spinning. But the question I want to ask you is that you mentioned vulnerability a little earlier, and I was just wondering who is in place that can take advantage of that vulnerability in other words like who who's the next navalny or is there one there well the the, the cupboard quite frankly i mean the cupboard is bare right so i'm not here to offer also but why i think that the nadezhdin example is important and what that says is that you know there there may not be an obvious leader of the opposition movement today, someone who is charismatic and who can bear the torch from from Navalny. But desperate times call for desperate measures, and perhaps the people themselves can rally around someone who is willing to stand up and, you know, maybe people who, who we are not aware of right now. But the support from Nadezhdin was real, and I think that this was something that, that truly scared the Kremlin because they cleared <laughs> they cleared the opposition of every bright personality they could think of and here's this guy who is this gray 60 year old you know nothing of a, of a of a candidate you know basically you can think of him as a laughing stop just to play the role and the support that he garnered was unexpected to say the least so you know the times may create the man i don't know we will leave it there, Sasha. Listen, I will chat to you. I'll chat to you off air. We'll have an natter over the next couple of days. But again, as always, it's lovely to hear you. It's so kind of heartbreaking in a way to 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 hear you because I know you're you've got family on both sides. You've got family involved and family divided. So we will chat to you very yes. soon. Thank you. Always a pleasure, David. Well, John, I mean, there is, there is Sasha. I think we should leave it there. We will come back to Russia, come back to Ukraine, of course, in the coming weeks. But uh, what it kind of underscores is a regime that has no compulsion about killing anyone. Yeah. So imagine what it feels like to be Russian now. And you're in Russia. You know what's happening in your country. You also know that Putin is not afraid of killing as I said to Sasha, this is like the white South Africans killing Mandela. Yeah. He was as big. Yeah, yeah, you know, yeah. 170 million people saw that video. He was a household name in Russia and snuffed out. Yeah. I mean, imagine how that feels if you're living in Russia now. It must be a very, very dark place. But, very dark place. But also, uh, if you see any, if you've seen any of the Russian TV or media coverage of it, it is very much a buy story. Oh, yeah. But it's, as Sasha said, you know, it's a buy story officially, but it's the only story unofficially. We'll talk to you Thursday.